Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you all could join us this morning. My name is Stevie Lawrence, and I serve as Vice President for Post-Secondary Education at the Southern Regional Council. Equity and diversity is so very important to the higher education landscape. As an interstate compact for education, we find that it is critical for us to hold conversations about this to provide greater access those who need higher education the most. As such, we have invited Dr. Taffy Benson Clayton, Vice President and Associate Provost for Inclusion and Diversity to engage you this morning around the issues of diversity and equity in higher education. To set the context for this morning's discussion, Hannah Badabaugh, who serves in our Office of Post-Secondary Education at SREB, will provide some context highlight various research and other issues that impact diversity and equity in higher education. So I'll turn it over to Hannah. Thanks so much, Stevie. And thank you again to everyone for being here today. Like Dr. Lawrence said, I'm gonna spend just a few slides here talking about equity and diversity in higher education, particularly focusing on college access and social mobility. So when we think about higher education and social mobility, we know that research continues to show that a post-secondary credential is critical for accessing the middle class. As skill demands increase across the economy, opportunities for good paying sustainable jobs are disappearing for those who do not have an education beyond high school. Researchers from the Center on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown found that over 95% of jobs created in the wake of the Great Recession went to workers with at least some college education. The last recession decimated low-skill blue-collar and clerical jobs, and the post-recession recovery primarily added high-skill managerial and professional jobs, which require a post-secondary credential. We also know that the unemployment rate for college graduates is about half that of those with only a high school degree, and that this is true both prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and during. However, the United States continues to see racial and ethnic disparities in post-secondary enrollment and attainment. While the share of the population with a high school diploma has risen over time for students of color, there are still gaps in bachelor degree attainment between some students of color and their peers. Today, African-American and Latinx high school graduates nationally overall enroll in post-secondary at similar rates to their white peers. However, according to an analysis by Young Invincibles, there are disparities amongst college enrollment from different high schools with lower rates of college enrollment for high schools that have high concentration of African-American and Latinx students. At high schools where African-American and Latinx students make up 40% or more of the student population, these students are 11 percentage points less likely to enroll in college the first fall after high school graduation and 20 percentage points less likely to graduate in six years. And it's also important to note that for those students who do enroll, the level, selectivity, and quality of the institution that they enroll in can vary across racial and ethnic lines. We're gonna zoom in on just one example of that right here. Seen in the graph, African American students attend for profit institutions at double their enrollment rate overall. So, so, to say that a little bit differently, African American students make up 13% of all college students, but 29% of students at for profit institutions. And the type of institution a student enrolls in really does matter. For profit institutions are more likely to have poor student outcomes and higher levels of student debt. While for profit colleges only enroll about 9% of all college students. They're associated with nearly half of all student loan defaults. And it's not just enrollment that we wanna look at, we also wanna talk about attainment. And when we look at that, we see that these gaps persist and have in fact grown over time. So in 1990, about 25% of white adults had completed a bachelor's degree or higher compared to about 13% of black or African-American adults and 9% of Hispanic adults. In 2019, we still see those gaps persisting. While 38% of white adults have a bachelor's degree or higher, only 24% of black or African-American adults and just 17% of Hispanic adults have a bachelor's degree or higher. And so while it is encouraging to see college attainment rates for African-American and Hispanic students increase over time, the percentage point gap between these groups and white students has actually grown. There's clearly still serious work to be done around post-secondary retention and attainment. And it's especially important to continue to focus on these concerns about equity and college access as we continue to deal with the ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
in looking at potential indicators of college access, specifically FAFSA completion rates, we're seeing some concerning trends. According to an analysis of data from the Office of Federal Student Aid by the National College Access Network, in the second half of 2020, states in the SREB region saw an approximately 15 percentage point decrease year over year in FAFSA completion rates. And while it's concerning that all students seem to be struggling with this crucial college access benchmark, when we dive deeper into the data, we find that the impact of the pandemic on access seems to be especially harsh for certain communities. Troublingly, decreases in FAFSA completion rates were even larger at certain high schools. FAFSA completion rates at high minority high schools dropped by about 20 percentage points year over year and by about 22 percentage points at Title I eligible high schools. It's crucial now more than ever that we consider diversity and equity in terms of college access and success. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Lawrence to do a quick introduction for Dr. Clayton and her team. Thank you so much, um, Hannah. As previously stated, we've invited Dr. Taffy Benson Clayton, who serves as Associate Provost and Vice President for Inclusion and Diversity at Auburn University. Um, I promised her this morning that I would not do a long, extensive introduction, but she does serve as um, the Executive Administrator on the campus for coordinating the institution's diversity and inclusion strategy. There, she is the Principal Advocate and Advisor to the President provost and senior university leadership on issues surrounding diversity and inclusion. This morning, I would like you to take some time and welcome and put your focus on all of the great things that Dr. Clayton is going to present to us this morning about how we can make our campuses more inclusive, more diverse, and so that we are doing the job as we should do as higher education administrators by providing greater access to those who need higher education the most. Welcome, Dr. Clayton. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevie uh, Lawrence. Thank you for this invitation. And thank you, Hannah, for enlightening us with data insights regarding higher education and social mobility with disproportionate post-secondary enrollment in for-profit institutions among Blacks and other minorities and post-secondary degree attainment gaps across race and ethnicity, all very important enlightening data. Now let's review the outcomes for our learning time together. The outcome from today's experience should increase your understanding of key equity related terms, understanding why evidence-based approaches and data disaggregation are so important, understand uh, promising practices for gaining deeper insights into racial and ethnic related equity gaps, and then understanding how to achieve impact with campus-based equity-minded practices. Keep these learning outcomes in the back of your mind, particularly number four, as we will come back to it at the end of the presentation. There will be a quiz at the end of this presentation, the intent of which is to empower you in your DEI practice. And so allow me now to level set regarding some key equity-related uh, terminology. Most of you are likely already familiar with these commonly used terms in DEI. Diversity, individual differences, group and social differences, and really encapsulated in a short term, all the ways that human beings are different. You see a more elongated definition there on the screen. Equity, the creation of opportunities for the historically underserved to have equal access and participate in the educational programs designed to close achievement gaps in student success and completion. And then inclusion, the active, ongoing, intentional engagement with the curriculum, with co-curriculum and in communities that allows for the increase in awareness, content knowledge, cognitive sophistication, and empathic understanding of the complex ways individuals interact within systems and institutions. And in some instances, we say the active intentional ongoing engagement that allows our institutions to reap the educational benefits of diversity. It's also about belonging and mattering. There are four components to inclusive excellence, which is a concept that is important in today's DEI lexicon. Inclusive excellence 
is about being a guiding principle for access, student success, and high quality learning. It is designed to help colleges and universities integrate DEI quality efforts into their missions and into institutional operations. And so it is an active process through which colleges and universities achieve excellence in learning, in teaching and student development, in institutional function and engagement in both our local and in global communities. And importantly, inclusive excellence is an alloy. It's an alloy that fuses together quality and diversity, right? To be excellent is to be diverse and is to be inclusive. So now let's talk a little about the, about the term equity mindedness. I wanna focus on this term because it will serve as a grounding and a centering concept for today's presentation, equity mindedness. Now, equity mindedness refers to the perspective or mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners, many of whom are on this call, who call attention to patterns of inequity in student outcomes. Prior to equity focused discussions becoming front and center in DEI discourse, the terms equality and equity were often used interchangeably. However, given the elevation of equity related discourse, by researchers like Dr. Estella Ben-Simone, Dr. Sean Harper, Dr. Dow G. Smith, and then comprehensive equity reporting by colleagues like the late Dr. Andrew Nichols of Ed Trust, Dr. Laurel Espinosa, formerly of the American Council on Education, who's now at Sloan Foundation, and the work of organizations like Achieving the Dream and the Gates and Lumina Foundations has really positioned our institutions to better understand the terminology, has equipped us with the tools and practices needed to identify inequities within our specific academic and broader environments and has positioned us to address needs and gaps toward achieving inclusive excellence. So let's talk about this first visual. Equality is about having the same exact resources. Equity reflects resources distributed based on needs. Said slightly differently, equality and equity both promote fairness, but equality achieves this through treating everyone the same, regardless of need, while equity achieves this through treating people differently, dependent on need. For good reason, the focus on equity discussions over the last year has been focused on racial equity based on the great research of the Center for Urban Education at the University of Southern California, we know that equality imagines an equal world while equity realizes that the world is not equal. For all the reasons that we see illustrated by the foundational scaffolding, providing some students with clear advantages. On this next slide, as we view equity through the lens of race, our focus should be on remediating systems, not students. We should redirect resources, strategy, and attention to pathways with the greatest need to fix bar uh, barriers uh, and provide intentional support. As a practice, we should regularly disaggregate the data. This is key. We should engage in goal setting and action planning we should train faculty and staff to be equity facilitators and then consistently ask questions to understand how our practices at our institutions may be impeding equity. In higher education, we also know that the equity lens can be applied more broadly across areas like household income, first in family to attend college, honors, IB and AP courses and even more encompassing to include gender, disability, and certainly many other areas. COVID-19 focused our attention on the fault lines of inequities 
that were exposed during the pandemic and to some degree are still being exposed. Having led an American Council on Education DEI COVID-19 community of practice, we were aware that on campuses across the country, numerous equity issues played out. From digital deserts requiring that universities respond to the technology needs of students with laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots, to universities making housing and food accommodations available for our international students who were unable to return home when we sent students away from campus and pivoted to fully remote courses, or to undergraduate and graduate students with families who needed assistance from food pantries on campus to alleviate food insecurity and to ensure that their households were fed. So while we are discussing equity today in a focus and specific manner around race in particular and ethnicity and some other groups that you'll hear about, first gen, et cetera, we understand that there is a broader scope to equity matters as well. So know that we certainly understand that. So equity mindedness, as I referred to earlier, is a defining body of research in this work. And it has been developed by researcher, Dr. Estella ben Simone, who is a University of Southern California professor at the Center of Urban Education. Ben Simone has coined the term equity mindedness, uh, which describes a mindset comprised of several key points of knowledge and awareness. Equity minded practitioners, as I mentioned, are evidence-based, they're race conscious, they're institutionally focused, they're systemically aware, and they're equity advancing. Equity mind is warrants that faculty, administrators, and staff access and acknowledge that our practices may not be working. Understand inequities as a dysfunction of the various structures, the policies, and the practices that are within our own control. And we question assumptions, recognize harmful stereotypes that harm student success, and then we reassess our practices to create change. Ultimately, equity-minded institutions and leaders hold themselves accountable for the success of our students seeing racial gaps as our personal and our institutional responsibilities. So knowledge of terminology, concepts, and frameworks, all of which we've discussed a bit already, allow us to engage evidence-based and data-driven approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion work so that we can understand better how applied equity-mindedness efforts can look operationalized on a campus, I've asked my colleague, Assistant Vice President Ada Wilson, who is a key member of the team that I lead in the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, to share a bit about our journey and applying equity-mindedness approaches in our context. Thank you, AVP Wilson, for, for sharing this today. And uh, we're going to be listening keenly to what you have to share. Thank you so much, Dr. Clayton. And I am absolutely thrilled to be here today to share um, a bit about Auburn's journey. Um, on the next slide, I'm really going to walk us through what it has meant to pull from the work of Drs. Lori Schreiner and Douglas Gufrida. Um, my subunit in this regard has been able to really operationalize an equity minded approach to student success through a framework that focuses on three key aspects of a student's journey to and through the institu institution, pre-entry, in-college experiences, and overall outcomes. Understanding that there is an undeniable link between recruitment and outreach allows us to establish pre-entry practices that focus on the importance of pulling in families early into the conversation, while also identifying cultural norms so that we can take an inclusive and often differentiated approach based on those cultural norms while also examining the skills and abilities of our entering students so that as institutions, we can be prepared to respond. In college experiences such as leadership development and focusing on cultural identity provide a gateway for student success. And we'll spend a bit more time here in just a minute 
Lastly, as institutions, our hope is that our students leave here with strong motivational orientation and intrinsic and extrinsic goals that allow them to pursue a fulfilling life beyond these walls. The programming model I will present to you in just a few moments will really highlight this level of the continuum. But before we move forward, I want to circle back to in college experiences that impact student success. Lori Schreiner's work on thriving on college campuses highlights how practitioners should consider safety and basic needs, preparedness, connectedness, and engagement strategies through an equity-based lens. We know that students who feel connected to a community with the appropriate level of challenges and supports are, are more likely to persist and graduate on time. What's important to note, however, is that an equity-based lens allows us to review our practices in a way that frames the possibility for our students to do much more than survive during their time at our institutions. Our hope, and this is in Shriner's words, our hope is that our students thrive on campus and leave e as even better versions of themselves. So on the next slide, I wanna talk about how at Auburn, my team identified an opportunity to advance equity-based strategies for a community that was not receiving direct institutionalized support, first-generation college students. In 2019, first-generation college students made up 8% of Auburn's undergraduate student population. Disaggregating the data allowed us to see that while the majority of first-generation students identify as white or Caucasian, we also have a critical mass of historically underrepresented students who also identify as first-generation college students. To gain deeper insights to the experiences of first-generation students, my team convened campus partners from across the institution to examine the first-gen student experience. They hosted focus groups with undergraduate students and drafted a comprehensive institutional report with a series of recommendations designed to enhance the overarching first-generation student experience. Viewing the first generation student experience through an equity, equity lens, we found that many of our multicultural and diverse students were experiencing Auburn at the convergence of many systems that impacted their overall student experience. From our qualitative analysis, we learned that our black students who also identify as first generation college students were working through experiencing microaggressions or feelings of imposter syndrome and isolation within their colleges at the same time that they were trying to unpack this hidden curriculum for navigating college campuses. Our working group was and continues to be committed to examining these experiences so that we can shape a more equitable college experience. And here's a bit of what we found. Increased financial support was the number one theme presented to the working group. This spring, we're excited to say our university has committed over $3 million to increasing need-based aid. And those students will be participating in our Tiger Excellence Scholars Program, an additional initiative I'll speak about in just a moment. This influx of resources will have a transformational impact on our students. But there's also a call for campus-wide staffing and support and engagement. This is top of mind for our working group, and our hope is to be able to launch a training for faculty and staff by spring 2022. Again, when we look at this third bullet point, the goal is to cultivate a sense of community pride and presence. Um, and to do that, we need a community of support from our, our colleagues and our peers. It is so important to also ensure that there are comprehensive recruitment strategies um, that occur early and often in the process. Let's think back to our model for um, student success. That pre-entry point is critical. So being very intentional in how we share information and how we connect our students and our families to this information is so important in the enrollment process. Lastly, we found that we must take the time to ensure our policies and practices are aligned with a student-focused lens. One way we were able to do that, I wanna provide a very specific example, is by having a keen understanding of the data. Through efforts like the Tiger Network, our hope is to inform and guide institutional processes. In the fall of 2020, we are very excited about the milestone of launching a Tiger Transitions first year experience course. Through the process of developing this course, however, our team found that there was not a first generation indicator for students enrolling in FYE courses. As a result, only 60% of those students who enrolled in this milestone course were in, in identified as first generation. 
However, that's not the end of the story. Next fall, the FYE team is excited to add this indicator so that we'll be able to touch more students. And on the next two slides, we'll see why these subtle nuances are important. At Auburn, we have learned that first generation students are less likely to persist than continuing generation students. And on the next slide, we see that first generation students have a lower four and six year graduation rate. Our hope with the Tiger Network is to continue to inform policies that directly impact first generation students, particularly those who lie at the intersection of other cultural and social identities. And one way that we've been able to do that on the next slide, we'll talk about the Tiger Excellence Scholars Program, which truly serves as an institutional exemplar for equity embedded practices. Grounded in four pillars, we'll call it TESP for short, because Tiger Excellence Scholars Program can be a bit of a mouthful, but TESP works to provide a space for identity affirmation while instilling a culture of high expectation and support. Academic excellence pill, the academic excellence pillar speaks directly to the academic achievement across our colleges and schools. We are so proud that the TESP GPA is higher than the average Auburn GPA, and that over 60% of our scholars have graduated cum laude for the past three years. I also have to stop and say that so many of our campus partners in the College of Engineering and the College of Science and Mathematics have transformational programs that support our PLUS scholars as well. So when we think about community, our arms are wrapped around our students in multiple places and spaces. And that's exactly what Lori Schreiner is asking for when we're talking about creating a culture of support where students can thrive. Let's move on to future focus. Future focus is really the departure element for our student success framework. Understanding that our goal is to ensure that when students leave our campuses, they are able to pursue a meaningful life and career. Earlier this week, our scholars engaged in a session on building out your LinkedIn profile. We brought in a speaker and he actually was prepared to give our students $1,000 if they had 500 LinkedIn um, connections. Only a couple of them had about 200 connections, but that's okay. I think it's a process of thinking differently and thinking big and bringing in student and bringing in speakers who challenge our students to think about what their next step will be. And one quick equity note with these sessions. We offer our sessions during two times of the day, at noon and at 6 p.m. to account for students who might be working and or need to care for their families. Again, our equity lens informs our practice and we're constantly reviewing and constantly revising our um, co-curricular experiences so that we're meeting students where they are. Leadership capacity is another critical element that encourages our students to explore leadership opportunities beyond OID. Our students are engaged in the University Programming Council. They serve as tutors for academic support. They're members of the Student Government Association. They're RAs. They are deeply connected to the Auburn experience. And that's exactly one thing, what we want. We want them to have a robust college experience so that they can be connected to those high impact practices that we all know also contribute to higher persistence and on-time graduation. Our hope is to provide, again, the necessary level of support to maximize our students' engagement across the institution. And lastly, themes of diversity, equity, and inclusion are deeply embedded into the core of the program. We want our scholars to understand the importance of DEI, not only at Auburn, but how it impacts their ability to make meaningful connections, engage across difference, and be a global citizen. Let's look at the next slide. So we have a pretty diverse group of scholars in TESP, and the majority of our program participants identify as Black or African American. We have a large number of multiracial students, Asian students, Hispanic and Latinx students, and our white student population as well. And so as we think about the demographic profile, it's so important that we shape culturally relevant and culturally authentic programming that meets our students' needs. So let's jump to a 2020 review. One of the aspects of TESP that I am most proud of is our current partnership with academic support. In late 2019, I wanted to find a way to ensure that scholars who fell below a 3.0 grade point average were receiving the necessary level of support to maintain their scholarship. And so this is an, the intersection of a system that I want to unpack just a bit more in our key takeaways and outcomes, but it's important to understand that students who fell below a 3.0 GPA um, are required to request um, an appeal and could lose their scholarship. 
So early on, I made the unilateral decision that all scholars were required, all scholars, I mean, every single one was required to take um, academic support coaching sessions. And that unilateral decision was an absolute mistake. And I have to be able to name that. I have to practice what I am expecting from my colleagues, right? Um, I so badly wanted to have our students engaged, but our teams had not come together to discuss the appropriate scaling. So we took the summer and we unpacked the, the resource needs for our students and identified the tangible investment that would be required for us to fully support our students. After signing an MOU and funding a graduate assistant in academic support, we were able to provide unique coaching sessions for our scholars who were about to lose their scholarship. And the results of our pilot were absolutely incredible. You'll see it here on the slide. Students who attended at least one or more coaching sessions showed correlations with the following outcomes an improved cumulative GPA, increased success with term completion, a higher GPA than their peers who did not participate. And by higher, I mean a 3.2 GPA versus a 2.58 GPA. And it's important to sit there for a second because Dr. Clayton mentioned early on that COVID-19 had a critical, um, re revealed critical aspects of um, equity gaps that existed, right? And so when we look at, at the timing of this, um, this program and this policy shift in our program, we have, to, we have to be able to view that through a lens of COVID-19 and understanding the need for a community um, and how coaching was one community that really assisted students. So let's look at 2021 and beyond. And I have to sit here just for a second because I absolutely love this photo, not because I'm awkwardly trying to take a picture of it in the top left corner, but because it embodies what we have been able to do for our students, even with a shift in modality. This photo is from a session we hosted with Black women attorneys. Two are managing partners at their firm, and one is a senior assistant district attorney. This moment was important for our scholars because it disrupted the narrative that Black women are not practicing law. And while we know that less than 2% of all partners identify as Black women, it was incredibly special to present a panel of that 2% to our scholars. Because as we all know on this line, representation matters. The virtual component allowed us to do this at a reasonable cost, and it will likely be an effort that we continue for our scholars and continue to scale up. So let's take a look at the numbers. This past fall, our students logged over 11,000 study hours. 69 of our scholars finished with a semester GPA of 4.0. And when, when I think about the, the study hours, this is a great policy shift that we have. We used to require our students to come in person to study. So in our Cross-Cultural Center for Excellence or in one of our conference rooms, um, we were even toying with the idea of creating um, spaces in the library just for TESP. And on a space, right, facially, that seems like a great way to hold students accountable. In 2019, however, we shifted our practice and, and started utilizing a mobile app so that our students could log in at their leisure online and not have to physically come to campus if they had to work or if they didn't have proper transportation. Again, we're identifying our student needs and, and, and still having a culture of high expectations, but shifting our focus on what we require to make it more accessible and equitable. And when we made that shift, we saw a dramatic rise in study hours um, and we see some of the outcomes in the GPA output for our students. I do want to, before I, I move forward, take a snapshot of the Gear Up Alabama at the bottom of the screen. Through a partnership with undergraduate admissions and university outreach, our team has been able to work directly with the Gear Up Alabama program to link program participants to our scholarship and serve as a critical touch point for their academic journey. Fall 2020 was the first semester that the full cohort of Europe scholars made it to Auburn University. And these students started as seventh graders and we're incredibly proud of their high academic marks, ending the semester with an average GPA of 3.68. If I could do a virtual applause, I would, because this is so important for our community and we're just thrilled about the partnership. And this is just the beginning of us being able to leverage TESP as an equity-based approach to informing student success practices, not just within OID, but across our campus community. So let's take a look at a few of our key takeaways. 
Building strong partnership matters for shaping an equity-minded student success practice. We want to ensure that our partners are speaking the same language and utilizing the same or similar philosophies embedded in the TESP program. Through these partnerships, we not only inform our own practice, but we can have an influence on the varied systems with which our students engage. Let's think about pedagogy and practice. How we do our work matters. From meeting students where they are by strengthening our social media presence. Last summer, we did um, crowdsource playlists, study playlists for students. You know, we really tried to leverage Instagram and Twitter as spaces for us to connect with our students. And we increased our followers by, I believe, 80%. So that was a good investment on our end but also identifying the technology needs and the resourcing needs that give us a better understanding of our students, really investing that time, that energy and that space into shaping an equitable experience. Lastly, with respect to pedagogy and practice, the timing, deliber delivery and modality of resources and support dissemination makes all the difference in how our students engage within our program. Last but not least, and I think I've kind of hit this throughout the, our talk today, being willing to take a look at ourselves, a critical look at ourselves and ask the hard questions, um, reviewing our policies and systems, coming together as institutional teams to unpack um, and, and understand the spaces where our students are struggling to get through the barriers in place, right? And identifying the strategies for as, how we as an institution can remove those barriers. So thank you for your time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Clayton for that quiz she promised at the end of our talk. Thank you, Assistant Vice President Wilson for sharing how we at Auburn are learning and applying equity-minded practices to programs within our context. Of course, uh, I promised a quiz at the end and I wouldn't want to disappoint. It's not actually a quiz, but rather a relevant point of focus for a way to us to punctuate sort of the end of this slide presentation. As we focus on our equity-minded practice, Ben Simone's equity-minded indicators are a well-curated list of questions to guide our practice. So I want us to read these indicators uh, and reflect on them a bit and then certainly think this would be a great way to inform some of the questioning uh, in the time remaining. I'm gonna just punctuate a few of these. Um, do we examine and report racial and ethnic participation in indicators that we monitor annually? So are we routinized in our approaches and looking at this? Do we have goals that are explicitly stated by race and ethnicity to improve retention and graduation and STEM participation? Do we rec recruit community college transfer students? You know, what about our community college transfer students and reporting? This is really about the theme throughout each of these indicators, whether it's on this slide about uh, these pieces and admissions and acceptance and yield. The question is, how are we disaggregating the data? You know, a, a, a wonderful colleague and mentor of mine, Daryl G. Smith, likes to talk about and has researched uh, this very issue. When we disaggregate the data, we gain insights regarding what is happening on our respective campuses. You know, it tells us things like who is succeeding? Who is experiencing, right? Uh, the, the, the fruits of the mission of our, of our institutions. So data disaggregation is key. Let's look at the next slide. We'll see the remaining questions. And it really just asks us how invested and how engaged are we in ensuring that we create a culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and yes, inclusive excellence and equity mindedness. These indicators are a real guidepost and roadmap for how it is that we can do that more effectively. And there, I want to pause and uh, turn it over to uh, Jasmine, who will help us uh, field questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So we had one come in, and I will start with that. James Fielder asked, 
in the slides, this was in your first few slides, Dr. Clayton, um, your comments use the terms Latina X and Hispanic, and both have been used. What is the difference? So, so interestingly enough, Latin X is a more uh, evolved term, um, and it is a term that we use a lot in diversity work. Um, originally, it began to um, indicate the inclusion of uh, women. So as we thought about Latina or Latino, it also represents the fact that we have um, a uh, LGBTQ community that also becomes included in the terminology. Uh, so in a nutshell, it's an inclusive way of being able to signal that uh, we are including all when we refer to this particular ethnicity. Ada, might you add anything or did I capture that well? I think you captured it just right. Great, thank you. Rupi Stevens Morgan asked, on your demographics profile, what is ever to conquer? Conquer, excuse me, it was a quote on your slide. Sure, um, Hannah, do you mind going back to the slide with the TESP demographics? Since we have some time, I, I, ha I can take a moment to unpack that uh, a bit more for the group so that you understand the framework for this program. So the Tiger Excellence Scholars Program is an overarching initiative that supports students who have been awarded either the Provost Leadership Undergraduate Scholars Program Award, we call it PLUS for short, or the Ever to Conquer Award. The light blue um, spaces are our students who have received the PLUS Award who are participating in the Tiger Excellence Scholars Program. And the darker blue line, or the dark, darker blue spaces indicate students who have received the Ever to Conquer Award. What's exciting about where we are in terms of Ever to Conquer and PLUS dissemination, we have nearly increased, we have nearly increased our wars for Ever to Conquer by about 300% in terms of funding. That was the funding in, um, in, influx I spoke about early on, the $3 million plus dollars. So we will have even more Ever to Conquer scholars in participating in the Tiger Excellence Scholars Program in the fall of 2021. Um, Ever to Conquer scholars must be first generation college students. And so it's important to note that as we're thinking about the first generation college student experience, as we're thinking about the system that impact intersecting identities and the students who will be coming in the fall, it's ever more important that we unpack and understand the first generation college student experience. Great, thank you so much. Bryce and Barksdale had two questions. I'll start with the first one. How can the state higher education agencies approach DEI, DEI pain points? I think first um, identifying what they are, right? Identifying what the pain points are. Uh, I, I then think um, sort of working with people who may have uh, some real uh, DEI practice or content expertise uh, to really help in crafting the strategies for it. You know, once we can identify what the pain points are, we can then determine um, how we need to approach them. And if you're talking about a specific institution, you know, that's a very localized and focused way of doing it. Uh, but then again, if you're talking about across a system, there may also be themes that you find that can be addressed in ways that allow a singular strategy to impact positively an entire an entire system across institutions. Hope that answered your question. And if not, Bryson, please feel free to use the chat or enter in another question. Please. The second question, how can state higher education agencies, oh, sorry, that's the same question. Okay, we have another one from D'Angelo Taylor. His question is, what do you view as the strongest obstacle to increasing diversity at PWIs during the current social climate? So D'Angelo, I see this as several things, right? So let me go through the list of what I think they are. Uh, I think institutions that don't engage in early outreach to students are missing an opportunity. Uh, and when I say students, I mean underrepresented minority students and even more specifically, uh, there's been a focus on black students. Uh, I also think that there is uh, 
a, a lack of what you don't have on your campus. So if you don't do not have robust enrollments uh, of black students, or if that's another underrepresented population, then it becomes difficult to attract some of what you do not have. Um, I would offer uh, also perceptions of climate, how students who are not yet enrolled at your institution think about your institution uh, can be a real obstacle. I would also say um, lack of, of scholarships, right? Lack of non-loan related aid uh, for institutions. And I think this was specific to PWIs is a, is a real issue. And I will also uh, say that we know that the research talks to us about the inextricable linkages between uh, black faculty and other underrepresented minority faculty presence and black students and other underrepresented minority presence. And those are the things, as the students say, all the things, those are the things that I think create these obstacles. And those are the things that institutions that are seriously equity minded have to begin to focus in on and have institutional will and make the appropriate investments around. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Um, Another question for you, Dr. Clayton. Can you define early outreach in relations to its increasing diversity on PWI campuses? So, you know, early outreach, I think, uh, for the programs that I have been associated with and, in, and programs that have had real impact, really focus on those aspects of identity that are underrepresented on one's campus. Typically, if we're talking broadly about it, we start with underrepresented minorities. And you all know this terminology is evolving. Uh, but underrepresented minorities focuses in on race and ethnicity. We're talking about Black students. We're talking about Latinx students. We're talking about Native and Indigenous students when we look at that. But it also, right, because of these multiple and intersecting identities and these other groups that we found to be important, right, and in a state like Alabama or arguably any other state. North Carolina is another state where I've been. We focus on, on things like first generation and on income levels, right? Pell eligible or other students, the designations that give us some insights uh, with regard to that. We may also look at, in, at schools, K-12 schools, right? High schools where we haven't traditionally um, recruited a lot of students, where we don't have a number of students enrolled from. Those all give us indicators as the types of students who we want to be filling the funnel with, who we won't want to connect with around engagement and outreach, and who we want to, to make sure that we help to um, begin to whittle down any sense of barriers to access uh, for those students. And I think it looks like designing programs that give students that kind of access. I want to yield to Ada because she's been really involved in running these types of programs. We've worked together at two different institutions and there's some real impact points that she might want to add or just details. Absolutely, and Dr. Clayton, you hit many of the major points. I think the only thing I will add is that the context of your institution and the context of your state absolutely matters. I'm gonna do a, a quick laser focus on North Carolina where there are eight tribal nations um, and four American Indian organizations across the state. So it has one of the largest populations of American Indian um, perspective students um, east of the Mississippi River. And so when our team at UNC Chapel Hill is thinking about how do we provide an early outreach, early access point, we were pulling on the learning from Daryl Smith in terms of providing an inclusive and differentiated approach to early outreach, right? So being able to connect with tribal leaders, being able to go into tribal communities um, so that our students could see us um, as a part of and integrally connected to our students. Similarly speaking, um, when we were thinking about providing early outreach to our Latinx or Hispanic student populations, understanding that there might be a need for us to invest the resources in bringing in translators so that students who were in their high, early high school, um, so sophomores and juniors weren't having to translate in the moment for their parents and families and were both families and students were able to be more engaged in the process. So I share that to say that when we think about 
um, early outreach. It's not necessarily always a one size fits all and it, requi and it requires a deep understanding of the context of your state, a deep understanding of the context of the region and of the institution. And when all of that comes together and we use the inclusive and differentiated model provided by Dr. Smith, we can create and shape experiences that meet the needs of varied communities. Great, thank you both. Now is a great time if you have any other questions, um, please submit them either in the question box or chat. As of now, we've covered everything. Okay, it's still feel free, we have a few minutes left, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Lawrence to go ahead and move on to the next segment or close us out. Thank you, Jasmine. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to definitely thank um, Dr. Smith and Ms. Smith for providing this dynamic presentation. Um, as SREB. Dr. Lawrence, we're losing you a bit. The audio seems to be going in and out. If I can have you, you just lean forward a touch. Do you hear me okay now? Yes, great. Thank you. Great. So sorry about that. Just, just stating that we, we want to definitely thank Dr. Clayton and Ms. Wilson for providing such a uh, dynamic present presentation this morning. As SREB is an interstate compact for education and we focus so heavily on improving the quality for uh, education for the citizens um, throughout this 16 state region, equity and diversity in higher education is extremely important particularly as it relates to access. Both of them um, focus very heavily on the access points um, within higher ed this morning and how these two um, areas of diversity and inclusion are so, so important to access. So continue to look forward to additional webinars and other topical areas and other, um, other presentations that SREB will put together to focus on these topics as we seek to define our role in this higher education space throughout the region and nationally. Again, we thank um, Dr. Clayton and Ms. Wilson so very much. We thank each of you for participating um, in this webinar this, uh, this morning, and we hope that you have a great remainder of the day. Please look out for the slide deck that um, either Hannah or Jasmine will send forward to you later this afternoon. And we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And if you don't mind, since we have just a few minutes left, if we can close okay. out on one last question that came in. Yes, Anyone feel free to answer this. Are there any points that would be particularly important to the for-profit schools? That is a great question. Mm. It, you know, I'll just chime in really quickly, just knowing what some of the Research says about for-profit schools, a disproportionate number of African Americans and Latinx are obtaining post-secondary um, education through for-profit education, which is largely offered um, online, as, as you know. So, so I think that um, I don't really know if for-profit schools have really sought out um, strategies to ensure that their environments are in for um, diverse groups of students to learn and obtain that. Seems obviously that though these groups are largely um, or in some way attracted to obtaining these types of institutions, but I think that's largely um, related to convenience. Dr. Um, Clayton and Ms. Wilson, any comments? I was certainly going to add, you know, it, it would appear that the research tells us that some of the attraction of underrepresented minority groups to for-profit institutions is because of the element of convenience, right? Uh, because these are people, sometimes uh, folks who are underrepresented minorities in our communities, one that I ident identify with, are busy, they're working, they're doing other things, and this allows them to have that access. So they've, they've in some ways addressed the issue of access, but what they haven't addressed is the, are the issues of completion, and the issue of debt loads, Absolutely. particularly when students do not complete. 
So I think some of the things that they could look at from a DEI perspective is really looking at how well, uh, given the overrepresentation of underrepresented minorities as a part of their student base, how well are those students completing? And we know what the data tells us about that. And how well are those students um, uh, dealing with the debt load? So what does that look like? Maybe um, aid counselors, maybe um, placement opportunities, maybe opportunities for people who are working and going to school at the same time. Are there growth patterns for them for upward mobility in their, in their jobs? Can the for-profit be helpful, institution be helpful in that? I think they need to get innovative and creative about it because these are pressing issues. If education is the great equalizer, one does not need to be further embedded or entrenched in these things that can keep you from flourishing, right? Like debt, right? And not having a degree after you've invested time and, uh, and money, even, in if they, even if there are loans, right? You have to pay them and that could be stifling for folks. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Wilson, would you like to add anything? No, I think Drs. Lawrence and Clayton really covered some of the overarching um, themes. And I also think being able to translate what um, we spoke about in terms of viewing the student experience through an inclusive and differentiated lens and understanding that there might be African-American students who are first-generation college students as well entering in and, and working through their institution. So how are you dealing with um, racial inequities that might be occurring in the classrooms or in what other barriers might exist that um, impede completion. I think Dr. Clayton really hit the nail on the head. Addressing this completion issue is um, really top of mind. And when you take an equity lens to it, how does that impact the long-term and departure um, success for uh, multicultural, diverse, and underrepresented students? Great, thank you for that last add-on. Well, with that, we will release you all and give you back three minutes into the start of your afternoon. Um, please note, we will send a recording link and access to today's slides. If you have any questions, you can respond to the email that you received and we will assist you. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.